Hey friends, my name is Gabrielle and welcome to Premius Reads and welcome back to an actual book video. Kind of. In a way. <laughs> so, so, it's been a while since I've done any kind of video related anything, but I've gotten really into the podcast. So I finally found a way where I could kind of talk about the podcast and have a video up at the same time. Um, so I wanted to try doing that because I really miss making videos and I think it's really fun and this is something I can definitely tie in in terms of talking about different true crime books um, and so I just wanted to try and see how it went and see what you guys thought. Okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and get started. I'd love to know what you guys think in the comments down below. Look, I've got like a microphone and everything. Oh my goodness. Okay. Oh, I gotta get stuff up. Hello and welcome to A Murderous Affair, your podcast about women in history known for mayhem and murder. My name is Gabrielle and today the one we are talking about has reached some pretty, pretty, I don't want to say epic, but maybe horrendous. Horrendous is a good word. Horrendous levels about what a mother would do to protect her child. And the answer to that is apparently anything, including human sacrifice. So yeah, we're going there today. Our murderess of the day is Leonarda Sheehan Shuli. And if you've got a weak stomach, then this may not be the episode for you. She is known for not only turning her victims into soap, but also cake and actually correcting the prosecution about the grisly details when she was caught. But let's start at the beginning. Leonardo was born in Montea, Italy in 1893 or 1894. She actually attempted suicide twice in her early childhood. Not sure at what ages or why. Uh, I couldn't find any articles that explain that either. In 1917, she married a registry office clerk, Raphael Pansardi, but her parents didn't approve of this marriage and had actually arranged for her to marry another man. Because she refused and decided to marry Raphael instead, it's said that her mother put a curse on her and whatever family she may have. Now, I don't know how much stock you guys all put in curses, but there definitely seems to be some kind of awful misfortune that just follows Leonardo throughout her entire life. So, in fact, Leonardo was so troubled by this curse that she actually went to visit not one, but two different fortune tellers, both of whom gave her extremely dark predictions. The first told her that she would marry and have children, but that all the children would die young. The second fortune teller she went to did a palm reading on her and supposedly said, in your right hand I see prison and in your left hand I see criminal asylum. Not a very good outlook either way. In 1921 she and Raphael went and moved to his hometown where she is, then is arrested and imprisoned for fraud for six years. I wish it explained a little bit more about that. None of the articles or anything that I found said why she was committing fraud or like how she got caught or talks any or talks anymore really about that crime. Granted her later crimes definitely do overshadow all of that but I just wanted to, I was a little curious about like her first recorded experience with the criminal world anyway. If you guys know anything about that definitely let me know. I'd love to hear from you guys on that. Like see if maybe I missed something somewhere. When she's released they move again to a town called Lacedonia but their new home is destroyed in the 1930 Irpinia earthquake and they were forced to move again. Her new new town is called Correggio and it's there that she opened a store. For a while things seemed to be doing well her store was popular and she was well known and well liked throughout the town. So do you guys remember what fortune teller one said about having children and that they were going to die young? So Leonardo had a total of 17 pregnancies. Out of those pregnancies, three were miscarried and 10 of her children that were born ended up dying in early childhood. As a result, she was extremely protective of her four remaining children. And in 1939, she learned that her oldest son, Giuseppe was being drafted into the Italian army for World War II. Now, Giuseppe was her favorite child in addition to being her oldest surviving child. She decided that she was going to keep him safe no matter what. And for some reason, to keep him safe, human sacrifice was required. In addition to being a store owner, Leonardo was also known to read fortunes for the people in town. It wasn't too suspicious then when she began offering fortunes to the women who were visiting her store. The first woman to accept this offer was named Faustina Setti. She was an old woman considered a spinster who was trying to find a husband, and Leonardo told her that she'd find him in a city called Pola. But 
this to-be husband would only be there if she didn't tell anyone about where she was going until she had already reached that city. She was instead to write letters and postcards that Leonardo would then mail out once she got word from Faustina that Faustina had reached Pola. Faustina agreed and then began to prepare to go, and before she made her trip, she stopped by Leonardo's one last time for final preparations, whatever those may be. Once there, Leonardo gave her a glass of wine that was drugged, and when she passed out, she proceeded to kill her with an axe. She then dragged Faustina's body into a closet and cut it into nine different parts. She describes in her own words, so if you've got a weak stomach, maybe skip ahead 30 seconds, but if you don't, prepare yourselves because this is what she says she does. Quote, I threw the pieces into a pot, added seven kilos of caustic soda, which I had bought to make soap, and stirred the mixture until the pieces dissolved in a thick, dark mush that I poured into several buckets and emptied in a nearby septic tank. As for the blood in the basin, I waited until it had coagulated, dried it in the oven, ground it, and mixed it with flour, sugar, chocolate, milk, and eggs, as well as a bit of margarine. Kneading all the ingredients together, I made lots of crunchy tea cakes and served them to the ladies who came to visit, though Giuseppe and I also ate them. This is probably the most demented cake recipe I've ever had the misfortune of reading. In addition to apparently using human sacrifice to save her son somehow, which is never explained, like nowhere does it explain, unless maybe she explains it and just never got written down or anything, but nowhere does she explain why she decided human sacrifice was necessary. I would really, I wanna know the reasoning. Why would you go to human sacrifice when trying to stop your son from getting drafted? Like, you don't just kill people and then hope somehow that leads to him not being drafted. Like, you, usually human sacrifice is done with like a purpose or back when it was still somewhat acceptable to do for certain religions and that sort of thing. So it doesn't ever say why she chose human sacrifice and that's something that really bugs me. She also took Faustina's life savings as payment which was a total of 30,000 lire back then, which was close to about 4,500 in US dollars in 1940. The next woman to fall victim to Leonardo was Francesca Soavi. She went to her in search of a new job and was ecstatic when she heard that Leonardo had found her a job at a school for girls. Just like Faustina, she was persuaded to write postcards and letters to friends to be sent upon when she actually reached the city, courtesy of Leonardo, of course. Similarly, Francesca also came to visit Leonardo before her departure, and Francesca was killed the same exact way by being drugged with wine and then killed with an axe. This was on September 5th, 1940. Leonardo repeated the same process with Francesca's body, disposing of her remains by baking them into tea cakes and serving them to her neighbors. She also took 3,000 lire from Francesca as payment. Her final victim was Virginia Cacioppo. Virginia was a former singer, a soprano, who actually sang at La Scala, which is like this really big fancy opera house. Leonardo told Virginia that she found her work as a secretary for an impresario, who is basically one of the people who's in charge of like organizing performances and plays and operas in Florence. Virginia was also told not to let anyone know where she was going and came to visit Leonardo on September 30th. And on that last visit, Leonardo once again drugged her with wine and then murdered her with an ax. But this time, she didn't just use Virginia's body to make the tea cakes. She also used her melted body to make soap. And this is in her own words. So once again, if you guys have a little bit of a weak stomach, skip ahead about 30 seconds. Quote, she ended up in the pot like the other two. Her flesh was fat and white and when it had melted, I added a bottle of cologne, and after a long time on the boil, I was able to make some mostly acceptable creamy soap. I gave bars to the neighbors and acquaintances. The cakes, too, were better. That woman was really sweet. Those are never words that I expected to ever have to read out loud. In addition to the tea and the soap, Leonardo also received 50,000 lire, assorted jewels, and public bonds. She even sold all of Virginia's clothing and shoes that she'd had on her that day. Virginia was Leonardo's last victim, and Virginia's sister-in-law was suspicious that Virginia just up and disappeared, suddenly, without a trace. She had last seen Virginia going into Leonardo's store, and she took her fears that 
Virginia was missing or something had happened to her to the police, who immediately began an investigation and ended up arresting Leonarda. She didn't admit to her crimes at first until she realized that the police thought her son Giuseppe had something to do with it. Once she heard that, or once she figured that out, she immediately admitted to all the crimes and provided enough detail to prove that she was the only one to have been involved. She was tried for murder in 1946 and remained completely unrepentant the entire time. Throughout the trial, she would actually call out corrections to the prosecution about how she committed the crimes that she was on trial for. According to an article published covering the trial, Leonardo gripped the witness stand rail with oddly delicate hands and calmly set the prosecutor right. Her deep-set dark eyed gleamed with wild inner pride as she concluded, Quote, I gave the copper ladle, which I used to skim the fat off the kettles, to my country, which was so badly in need of metal during the last days of the war. She was found guilty of her crimes and sentenced to 30 years in prison. She was also sentenced to an additional three years in a criminal asylum. Leonardo Ciancioli died of cerebral apoplexy in the Women's Criminal Asylum on October 15th, 1970. And there's actually a bunch of stuff that was taken from this case and is now on display at the Criminological Museum in Rome, which I didn't know existed, but I am extremely interested in finding out more about and when travel is allowed again, I'd love to go to Rome and see this place because I've been to Rome and I did not know that that was a museum that you can visit. While Leonardo was in jail, she did what many criminals tend to do for some reason, and she wrote a book about her crimes called, quote, an, em an Embittered Soul's Confessions. Now, I wasn't able to find any place that this book was sold or a place where I could download it or just read it for free, um, and I think that's probably for the best, but there are a lot of places that quote excerpts from it. So a lot of the quotes that I read from during this episode were actually taken or supposedly taken from the book itself. My sources today were Wikipedia, Murderpedia, and also the Museo Criminologico.it, which was an article I found on Murderpedia, so it's there too. The fact that she wrote her own memoir makes me wonder if she just kind of made up the fortune teller thing because I feel like that was really spot on, both of them. And I get like before the 1940s predicting that someone would have children that would die young, not that odd or uncommon. But it's just the prison in one hand and the criminal asylum in the other hand that makes me really wonder like that feels like it was just too on the nose. Like she just happened to throw that in there because it made for a good story. So I highly doubt that actually happened, but you never know. I just highly doubt that actually happened. I hope you guys all enjoyed this episode. Definitely more of the WTF stories that I've covered here. And as always, you can find me on social media at Frumious Reads on Twitter, Tumblr, YouTube, Instagram, all of the above. So come scream with me about women in history and the murderous affairs they committed. See? See what I did there? That was a good one. You can listen to this podcast on Apple, Podbean, YouTube at youtube.com slash C slash Frumius, F-R-U-M-I-O-U-S, Libsyn, basically anywhere you listen to podcasts. And check out our actual podcast merch at frumiusreads.com forward slash shop. That's F-R-U-M-I-O-U-S-R-E-A-D-S dot com forward slash shop and get some cool Murderous Affair t-shirts. Make sure you subscribe or follow wherever you're listening to this. And thanks again so much for listening. As always, stay spooky, friends, and I'll talk to you soon. Goodbye. Ah, the first podcast episode I've ever recorded with a video. All right, so that's the first podcast episode I've ever recorded with a video. I'd love to know what you guys thought of it, and I'll talk to you later. Okay, bye.